Number one, what do you guys consider an emergency? And how do we determine if something is an emergency? And the way I define emergency is we're going to drop everything we have going on and we need to get there right now. Okay, that's our definition. If you guys want to give me a different definition of emergency, we can run with it. But can we all agree that if we're going to call something an emergency that we need to provide an emergency service for, that it's kind of a, we need to drop everything and get there right now. Does anybody want to dispute that or change that definition a little bit? We can run with that. Okay. Okay. So I want to talk about like what jobs qualify as that. Number one, how do you guys define something as an emergency service that you need to provide? And then number two, when we go out on that emergency, especially if it's after hours, like what do we need to do? Like what is it necessary for us to do? What needs to get done? Okay. So events right? These are some events, but I think that the the reason we would define something as, as needing emergency service is a little bit deeper than that. So some people throw out something that would cause you to drop everything and get there right now. Uh, the fire sprinklers can be really bad. Okay, absolutely. So fire sprinklers, that, that can cause a lot of damage. Right. A lot, it, lot. Yes. it can cause a lot of damage. So we're going to want to get out there on site um, as quickly as we can and start taking care of that. OK, good. Um, what else? Any water. A lot of water. Yeah, a lot of water, standing water. Um, that could certainly cause you to to go out there. So let me throw out some other things. If the event that's causing the damage is happening right now, like generally I'm going to call that an emergency. Okay. If, if it's a referral from a plumber affiliate partner, an insurance agent, an adjuster, if it's a referral, I'm probably going to drop everything and get out there right now. So I continue to get referrals from them. If you're on the phone, you're the one answering the phone. You have the phones that night. Um, if the customer thinks it's an emergency and you want that job, then you need to dispatch immediately. If the customer thinks it's an emergency and you want that job and schedule them for 830 in the morning, I guarantee they're going to find somebody else before you get there. Yeah, I think... I mean, the same way, any standing water, a crew has to go out. And then I think you nail it, you know. You had some calls when your customer calls and died, and even though they don't know, maybe, you know, whether or not it's been happening for a day or two, they're panicking and they don't know what to do. So if I, if I cannot convince them this can wait for the morning, I unfortunately have to send someone out. Right. So I think that kind of, you know, gets you in that ballpark of these jobs that we're kind of considering an emergency, the ones we need to get out there, either situationally because of the cause of the damage it's happening right now, or potential relationships from the referral, or the client is considering this an emergency and you want the job. So we're going to drop everything and get out there as opposed to scheduling them for the morning and potentially losing that job. Okay. So now I kind of want to talk about what emergency services consist of. You know, this this picture up here with the floor mat drying system, this is probably not what an after hours emergency service call out is going to look like for me when I leave. But this is probably not what my job is going to look like if I respond at midnight when I leave. It'll potentially look like this. I've got some air movement going, maybe a dehumidifier, that type of thing. But I might not get this whole setup done on day one of that emergency service call out. So let's talk about what we need to do. A couple of weeks ago, I got called out to an emergency service um, with a local uh, restoration company that we work with. 
And these were the things that were important that if they decide it's an emergency, you agree it's an emergency, that you arrive quickly. Don't tell them we'll be right out there and get there in four hours. Don't do that. If you're providing emergency service response, it needs to be a quick response. Thorough inspection. There are a couple things that you don't want to rush. Even though I'm going to tell you we can modify all the services we're providing on that after hours call out, there's a couple things you can't rush. The inspection and your communication with the client. Make sure that you're patient and you take your time when communicating with the client and make sure that you don't cut corners on your inspection. We still want to do a really thorough inspection so we understand the scope of that job. Let the client know that they can file, you can help them file a claim tomorrow when you come back. Okay. Set equipment to stabilize. We're going to get into like, what stabilize means like based on the job. If you need to call trades in, you know, you can call them in tomorrow usually unless you need help, uh, emergency help from a trade. Um, explain the importance of leaving the equipment on before you leave and then take your initial walkthrough and equipment setup video. And this is why I know we might not be doing it on every job. On an after hours job, I think the initial walkthrough and the equipment setup video is so important because here's the thing. You might be rushing because you just want to get out of there. So some of our documentation might not be as good as it should be. But if we have video, we can always go back and make sure that we're charging for everything we did. Right. If we have initial inspection video and equipment setup video, we can basically go back and make sure that we've covered all those items that we did. And it's really important because this was after hours work. So a lot of those things can be billed as after hours. So we don't want to miss anything. I always talk about these five principles of water restoration, safety, document and inspect, mitigate further damage. One, two, and three need to be done on that emergency call out. So number one, provide for health and safety. S-500 says that we shall, right, most important, identify and manage potential safety and health hazards. During the inspection process, we shall make a reasonable effort to identify potential hazards and then also communicate potential hazard. So let's look at this video. Take a look at this. We arrived at a job. <clears throat> We've got water coming down through these canned lights. Okay. And then it's not just in that uh, room, but it's in this room as well. So we've got we've got water coming down. There was a hot water heater in the attic. It burst. Um, it's flowing down through these can lights. We respond. Talk to me about safety measures that we need to make sure we've taken care of before we can leave this home. Make sure the power hasn't been compromised with the with the lights. Absolutely. So we need to make sure that there aren't any issues with the electricity. I think to be safe, I would probably have them turn off those breakers. We want to make sure. Is not going to cave in and, you know, fall somewhere. Absolutely. So if we need to, you know, drain that ceiling because there's water up there that's going to make it heavy and potentially that ceiling could fall down, that's a huge safety hazard. So we have to make sure that the integrity of that ceiling is not compromised. <coughs> if it is, it either needs to come down, the water needs to be extracted, it needs to be drained, um, something needs to happen, but we absolutely need to make sure that that ceiling is not going to fall down. What other potential safety hazards? Depending on the type of flooring, you know, if there's water on the floor, it's a slip and fall hazard. Man, you are nailing it for me today. I did not give Constantine notes for this class, just so you guys know. But slip, slip and falls are huge, right? So depending on the type of flooring, um, if there's water still draining down from that ceiling, we don't have full extraction of that ceiling done yet. We, of course, need to make sure that there aren't any slip and fall hazards. So, And then um, 
there's another in section eight of the S 500. Um, one of our responsibilities um, is to really control exposure. So they call it exposure prevention. So if there's any contamination, we either need to set up containment or remove the contaminated items that could perhaps expose the homeowners to any health issues. Okay, so, so think about that as well. Contamination is an issue. Um, exposure prevention is a shell for us. So that needs to happen before um, we leave the, the property on that first day with emergency service. So document and inspect. We talked about a really thorough inspection. We still have to find the edge of migration. The S-500 requires us on that first visit after the thorough inspection um, to identify category of water, class of water, or extent of wetting. And that can happen with percent, uh, moisture percentages for affected materials types and quantities of affected materials, and then any apparent or potential damage. I like to add on here pre-existing conditions and any complications that you might see on the job. Okay, potential for asbestos, um, you know, those different types of things, structural um, concerns, any of those things should also be documented. Okay, so that's what the S-500 tells us. When I say documentation, this is day one, what else do you have to make sure that you have? All right, who's who's saying that? Excellent. Cli any client forms, work authorizations, any sign-offs that you need, those types of things. So do not forget that you still need to get all of those initial forms, all of your initial day one client forms signed. Then I said, Photos, initial inspection videos, setup videos, and then scope sheets. So I know that you guys mostly are using scope sheets in Circle or your other programs, but these are the things that you need to make sure you document, whether you're using paper copy or you're putting it in there. We need all equipment that was placed. We need your initial moisture points. Okay, and your readings, um, temperature, relative humidity, like all those things that we need. We need all of those. And then all of your billable items, extraction, was it weighted, you know, anything that I demoed, those types of things. And particularly, we need all of these billable items because most of them have an after hours line item assigned to them. So this documentation usually falls short on emergency service callouts, which is why I focus so much on these videos, because we can always go back and recreate this as long as we have your video and photo documentation. This can always be recreated as long as we have these things. But again, super important that we have thorough documentation of this so that after hours line items can be billed appropriately. The mitigate further damage. So S500 again, we should, it's not a shall, this is a should, so this is standard of care, attempt to control the spread of contaminants and moisture to minimize further damage. So you know, that to me always screams extraction. What else do you kind of think falls in here when we're thinking about services? What else falls under this controlling the spread of contaminants and moisture to prevent further damage? Uh, blocking and padding furniture? I guess. Okay, okay, absolutely. Blocking and padding furniture. Any contents that are in that area that could suffer from secondary damage in the eight hour period before like your team probably comes back the next day or 10 or 12 hours. Anything that could potentially be further damaged, we need to try to protect. So that would include contents. So 
furniture blocking and padding. I love it. Thank you for bringing that up. What else? Setting up stabilizing equipment is also mitigating for damage. Absolutely. So when I think mitigate further damage, that to me is also stabilization. So dehumidifiers set up so that we can tr- control the humidity in the environment, extraction, absolutely, if we can, um, and it's appropriate, air movement to start getting that air movement flowing. If there is a um, microbial load and it's appropriate to spray an antimicrobial, um, <laughs> absolutely do that as well if it's going to control the spread of contaminants. But when I see spread the control of contaminants, generally for me, that's pulling out materials um, that are contaminated if necessary. So sometimes demo does happen on that first visit or setting up really good containment with negative air. So that we're not cross contaminating and um, residents in the home are not exposed, right? We're preventing exposure. So those things could fall under there as well. Okay, so again, one, two, and three, and sometimes, you know, four, we're going to start, you know, to dry, um, but I'm really concerned with mitigate further damage slash stabilize the environment. And if some drying happens, great. Um, But I just really need one, two, and three to happen on an emergency service call out. So this is one that, um, this is the one that I went out to a couple of Weeks ago, the water was coming in through this window. Well, we had all this snow, but then we had like two weeks of rain. So all this snow is melting, right? And there's nowhere for it to go. So it's coming in through window wells. It's seeping up through concrete foundations, those types of things. So it came in through here. And then this line around here on the left, you see it over here. It runs um, from this tile into carpet. We did pull up the carpet pad after we did extraction on this because it was a pet pad. Um, it needed to come up. It wasn't going to stay in place. So we did remove the carpet pad. Um, and then obviously documentation, make sure everything is set up. And then uh, we did the initial equipment set up. I'll go ahead and just play this. You can see that what they chose to do was float this carpet. It was a tufted, not a woven, so we could float it, um, put the air movement along the um, exterior because that's where the majority of the water was. We had the dehu with the exhaust facing the source of the loss, and then all furniture was moved out of the area and then blocked um, on this unaffected tile area. Uh, just to make sure that there wasn't any secondary damage on the furniture. So that's what we did. It took us about an hour and a half. um, And that was the extent of that, you know, emergency service call out. We arrived quickly within 90 minutes, um, did a really thorough inspection. We took the time to talk. The wife was home. The husband was out of town on work. Um, so we spoke to the husband on the phone. He wanted a basic estimate so he knew whether or not it was appropriate to file an insurance claim. He decided he would file an insurance claim. We set the equipment to stabilize. We called the plumber, um, one of our plumbing partners, to come out in the morning uh, just because we thought we knew where the water was coming from, but just to make sure there wasn't a broken spigot or a burst pipe or something like that, um, the homeowner asked us to to have a plumber come in. We explained the importance of leaving that equipment in, and then we took the initial walkthrough videos as part of our documentation. So, you know, that was the the process there. We were there not quite two hours, I think. All right, so you don't have to do it all. Just what you do, make sure you document well that it can be recreated and that you set yourself up for success um, when you return the next day.